Mr. McMeekin, can you hear us? I can, yes. Okay, great. And we Okay, call the meeting to order. Do I have someone to open a meeting in prayer? Uh, Mr. Johnson. Creator, we ask for your blessing and guidance as we have this meeting. We ask us to grow closer as a group so we may nurture the bonds of community for all the members of the Northwest Territory and for all our residents. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our next item under review is adoption of agenda. Are there any additions and changes to the agenda, Madam Kirk? Uh, public hearing followed by a wrap-up discussion. Thank you. Hearing no changes to the agenda, can I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Ms. Nockaby. Thank you. Having reviewed adoption of the agenda, are there any declarations of conflict of interest from the members? Hearing none, thank you for the committee. We'll be, we'll be going, uh, we'll be going to Live shortly. Madam Kirk, ready? ready? Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. That. Good evening. Now I call this meeting to order of Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment to order. I'm Jackie Jacobson. I'm the MLA for Nanakput, the chair of the Standing Committee of Economic Development and Environment. We are joined today by members of the Standing Committee of Social Development, uh, together as the committees um, of the Legislative Assembly. We identified food security as an area of concern to us. Today, I'm holding a public hearing on food security (NWT). Please note that the uh, meeting is uh, live streamed, so. I'd like to remind all members, presenters, to direct the questions and comments to myself as the chair and wait to be uh, recognized before speaking. This would help our meeting go a lot smoother and quicker. I'd like to ask members now to introduce themselves now, starting on my right. Oh, sorry, uh, Kevin O'Reilly, uh, Frame Lake. Caitlin Cleveland, Cam Lake. Ryan Johnson, MLA for Yellow Life Park. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Katrina Knockleby, MLA for Great Slave. Thank you. Thank you. Those uh, who are welcome, everybody who's in attendance here tonight, thank you for coming. I've, uh, if you have not already registered to speak, I'd like you to present uh, to the committee, please uh, let our staff know, Katie, and uh, we'll get you put on the list. We have five presentations registered to speak this evening, so. First of all, uh, Janet Dean, Executive Director, Territorial Agri-Food Association. Thank you and welcome. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Janet. And I'm just okay to go ahead? Yes. Thank you. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I'm with the Territorial Agri-Food Association, an association that uh, turns out that a lot of people don't know we exist or what we do. Uh, so we support and advocate on behalf of everybody who's actively engaged in the food sector in the NWT or want to be active in the sector. And that includes right from farmers and growers to harvesters to producers to restaurants to chefs, distributors. So everyone along the um, agri-food value chain. Um, next please. Now when we look at food security, we are looking at the food side of food security or food insecurity. We recognize that there are many other factors. Uh, we know that there's all kinds of uh, data about you know increasing minimum wages and things like that, but we're looking specifically or here to talk specifically about the food aspect of um, re reducing food insecurity. Next please. 
because we recognize that no matter what the challenge is when it comes to hunger, it has to start right where the journey of our food begins. And that's where we represent the sector, where we talk about food from the land and food from the farm and how that makes its way through our system here in the NWT and how that impacts on our ability to be food secure or at least more food secure. Next, please. Uh, so we are uh, suggesting, or I, I guess suggesting to a crowd that already agrees, that food security needs coordinated sustainable interventions, that it's not something that can be done by any one group or through any one initiative, uh, but it's really important. We felt that it was really important that you understand and recognize that a sustainable food system includes sustainable livelihoods for people working within that food system, and that um, we need to make sure that it isn't just a celebration of um, intention, but that we see actionable results. We see efforts to create change uh, involving these coordinated sustainable interventions. So we don't want to gain an optimism. We don't want to hear in a year that we're all happy that we're doing something about food security. We want to see something done about food security. And uh, we are wanting to be an active player in that. We're willing to commit to take action and to uh, assist you in whatever way we can assist you. Next, please. We recognize that the NWT is at the end of a very long supply chain, and uh, that it's those supply chain issues that developing our sector can have the greatest impact on. Um, our food system is vulnerable. It's too inconsistent supply. We saw it certainly during COVID, but also when forest fires shut down the roads coming into our communities, and with some of the climate change, it's expected or predicted that there will be more of those kind of catastrophes. Uh, um, so we know that um, if we can work on developing the system and the networks and the entrepreneurs here in the NWT, we can have a dramatic impact on that. Um, you might recall that during at the height of COVID, the two meat processing plants in Alberta lost 1,600 employees to COVID between the two of them, which put 70% of the national beef supply at risk from two operating plants in Alberta. Uh, we don't want to be held hostage to those things. We believe that um, there's lots of opportunity. Most of the food uh, that is produced in the North right now are whole foods that are um, grown like with minimal processing, uh, but there's also um, promising opportunities for value-added processing, for incorporating traditional foods, uh, lots of other opportunities that we think as a sector that uh, needs to be focused on. Uh, so if you could, uh, next please. Uh, so in an effort to try to match the very short timeline that we have to give you information, uh, I wanted to keep it focused on five recommended areas. So um, we're asking that it be examined or that food security from the food sector that we're talking about, uh, we're recommending five focus areas and have uh, specific suggestions in those areas. And as I mentioned before, we'd be happy to work with you, um, provide any data, produce any reports, anything that you need to, to help you champion what you continue to champion and that we know is an important issue for you. Next. So in the first one, when we look at supporting new farmers, um, we need to make sure that our new farmers, uh, significant challenges are addressed. So that's challenges in terms of access to land, access to capital, training, uh, labor, some of the current agricultural policies that either exist and are problematic or that don't exist and that limit some of the things that we can do. Um, we also have many of our farmers in the north don't come from established farming families or farming backgrounds, which means that we have legacy problems. We have the challenge of finding uh, replacements should they decide to leave or pass on uh, what it is that they're, they're doing, but also learning and sharing information because we are a very unique uh, environment and a lot of those lessons have been learned for a very long time and they're not being shared. Uh, we've just produced a uh, an agriculture timeline for the NWT that goes way back to experimental farms, uh, farms up and down the, the valley. Like There's just so much information that we should be able to access to help our growers succeed that we're just losing because we don't have this these legacies. Um, and that we need to encourage 
Agriculture, food production, and harvesting is a viable career option for young people, but for people generally, people that maybe don't fit into the government model, people that are based in a community and want to stay in a community. Uh, that it really is, there's all kinds of work related to this food production in this food sector that people just don't know about, so they don't know to choose it as a career option. Even things like being a food scientist. Imagine a resident food scientist. and there's something that many young people could could do and be motivated by and encouraged by that would help uh, what we're trying to accomplish in the north and really work towards um, getting more nutrient-dense foods um, grown and produced in the NWT. Next. Uh, there also are some significant barriers that need to be addressed, uh, and certainly um, this sector is a resilient sector. Uh, they go through a lot and they keep bouncing back, but there's still barriers that uh, could be addressed. So um, finding ways to deal with the fact that distance and access are huge barriers to food distribution. So if we are growing in a community or we want to send food to a community, how does that go back and forth in a reasonable cost model or a reasonable time frame model. Um, that includes uh, perception barriers that we can't farm or produce food commercially. We still hear politicians and public members say we don't grow food in the north, where our dirt is bad. Uh, there's all kinds of things, but there's also all kinds of innovative ways that we can address these. So we need to manage those perception barriers. And we hope that you can manage them too as our advocates. Um, the economies of scale, we are a small market, so we need to reduce trade barriers across uh, provinces and territories because it's not viable for many of our, our people to just produce or sell in the NWT. And even some of the existing foreign worker programs that require, uh, you know, uh like, so for example, like McDonald's has the infrastructure to bring in several workers uh, to supplement their existing HR staff needs, but our farmers and our producers and our restaurants are small. And if we had a way to be a sector, do a sector program, uh, rather than just not meeting the criteria of the standard program, that would make a huge difference. Um, I don't think I've spoken to one member since I took over this job who hasn't said that HR is an issue, um, and it's because they're small and accessing those HR inputs is tougher for them than for some of the larger employers in the sector. But I also have one thing missing on this slide, which is a really important one, and that's the cost of doing business. And so, you know, the power subsidies, the tax, we pay many of our communities, um, agricultural land is taxed at residential rates. We are the only province or territory in the nation that taxes farmland at residential rates. Um, and so things like that, our power, uh, many other uh, places, uh, provinces and territories uh, provide sp uh, power subsidies or assistance with dealing some with one of the water and conservation issues that we have to address. And so that cost of doing business has to come down because it's just not viable. Um, to be able to produce at the scale we need them to produce when their overheads are so overwhelming. Next. We also think certain legislative changes can be helpful, um, certainly your expertise. Uh, any t uh, provincial or territorial laws that may prohibit or restrict internal trade, uh, that's trade across the, the provinces and territories. Um, we certainly have those as an issue. Some of the paperwork requirements that our farmers go through, some of the um, hoops that they have to jump through for really basic activities can be onerous and we have to remember these are people who are farming and producing food and processing food and cooking food and that takes up a lot of their time and all of these um, paperwork and legislative obstacles take them away from that and away from generating the food that that allows us to move towards food security uh, so just a general list of legislation um, there was a, a national paper produced um, by the Canadian Agricultural Association that says every province, or well, they said province, let's just be real, they said province, uh, should take a look at these uh, categories, general environmental, water resources and confirmation, land use, livestock and poultry, all of these are, are standard uh, pieces of legislation to examine and review and see if they're working for us. And we know that some aren't. We know that there's a problem to 
I don't commercially sell meat, any meat, anybody that is uh, got chickens for sale or wants to grow pork. We've had abattoirs here in the past. We've had cattle grown here. We have a, had lots of hog farms. Um, but now we're not in a position, the legislation is such that we're not in a position that we can commercially sell those. And that would take a huge step towards food security. Um, and then just that many of our messaging is not clear that our restaurants don't are getting mixed messages about food safety and about what they can sell and what they can't sell and making sure that that information is clearer and more easily accessible to the people who are needing it to be able to drive their businesses forward. Next please. Uh, and then I think the easy one, the low-hanging fruit, is we hope that you'll be able to champion local food. We want you talking about it. We want you telling people about it. We want you to champion things that we do. Um, if we're looking at a territorial school food program, that's great, but let's make sure that those school food programs prioritize the inclusion of local food. Let's state, set targets for public institutions to have uh, local food. And let's do it now before the food is ready to be consumed because farming doesn't happen at the turn of a hat. It's It takes time. So if we've got policies that require public institutions to prioritize local food, our farmers can put the food in the ground and get that out and get that system going and then we can encourage more. But that's two years out. We can't wait to change the legislation until the food's available. Um, prioritize food vendors supplying or buying local. Your own um, service providers that provide food to you that cater. Uh, some way to um, to prioritize supplying or providing local. And we really do think that agri-food agri education and career options needs to be part of the NWT curriculum. Uh, we're working on that. We hope that you uh, champion that and help us get that messaging out. There are already some amazing strides. There's a teacher in Bechico that has built a 12-unit hydroponic system that is saved in their first harvest $1,000 worth of food that went into their school uh, food program and that the children got to take home and teach their parents parents how to cook with this healthy food. I mean, those are exciting success stories, but we need to prioritize that in our schools as well. Next. And we can't forget that food has to be a part of our reconciliation efforts, that we need to strengthen our regional food systems. We need to incorporate indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, of course, um, but they must be supported as key food provisioning activities alongside our farming and agri-food activities. And we need to collaborate with our indigenous leaders on cross-cultural provisioning um, so that the lessons learned, the messaging, the food available can be shared um, within sharing economies. Uh, we 12.6 percent of NWT households, um, where 75 percent or more of the meat and fish eaten in the household was obtained by hunting and fishing. 12.6 percent. That's not enough to feed our uh, territory. That's not food security. It's traditional hunting and fishing. It's a fantastic initiative, but it needs to be more. Uh, and if it can't be more, it needs to be shared. Um, even. Uh, other low risk activities of on the land gathering or harvesting, we still see um, from the Bureau of Stats numbers as low or as high as 32%, but that's it. Uh, and we need to make sure that that information is available to, pe to people, they know what to do and they're able to participate in those activities to help themselves become food secure. Next please. So we want to work with you to create an environment of opportunity. We want to make this something that is action oriented, that we're moving forward and we're not talking about it. Um, our industry, our sector doesn't like to navel gaze. We like to take action and make things happen. We want to keep that going. We know that collaboration is key. We're ready and here to collaborate. Um, and we think that accountability needs to be part of it. PEI is the only jurisdiction in Canada right now to have set specific targets for food insecurity reduction. We think the NWT should join on with that and set specific targets so that we can all action and work towards them. Next. So uh, <laughs> I thought this was a great 
witty thing, but everybody I've showed it to, it's not, said, it's not that witty. But the first step to food security in the NWT is right under our feet. It's the land, it's uh, the farms, it's, it's uh, the water that we fish in. Um, we envision an agriculture sector, sector that is environmentally sustainable, economically viable, and focused on producing healthy, safe, nutritious food for all of the NWT, not for segments, not for individuals, not for one community over another, but for all of the NWT. Next. And so that's my time. My only last comment is if you'd like to learn more about what's going on in our sector, come to our conference on February 24th. Uh, we've got some exciting people talking about some exciting things. Um, and you're welcome to attend for all or part, whatever is best for you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Janet. Um, any questions from Ms. Nogleby? No, no. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to say thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, one of the things that I really like is that you've come with some solutions and some really tangible things that we can actually do probably in the next eight months or whatever that is left of this assembly, so I appreciate that and I actually don't have a lot of questions around it, but I think you've made just some really, really good points about the, the complexity of everything and, and it was really impressed upon me as the Minister responsible for agriculture at the beginning of the pandemic, just how vulnerable uh, we really were. And so I just want to say like I, I sat here the whole time and nodded along and, and can't support uh, your association enough. And, and just what I see in the very short time that it's been in operation, like I know that you'll be able to do really good things with it. And so I'm, I'm excited for this to move forward. So thank you. I don't really have a question. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Which, which one's going to light up? <clears throat> thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I really enjoyed it, and it was very content heavy, and so I'm, I also look forward to going back and, and watching this again. So I love it when we can do public things like this where we have that um, av available to us. Um, one of the things that I have heard from some food producers in the Northwest Territories is comments in regards to reporting for current grants from with G the GNWT and I'm wondering if you've heard any feedback in regards to that from any of the people um, that are members of your association and if you can uh, provide any additional information or context to that. Uh, sir, yeah, sorry. Ms. Cleaver, Ms. Dean, go ahead. Apologies. Um, so yes, I have heard that on occasion. Uh, we're here to help them. And I, what I hear mostly is that everybody says I hate paperwork and there's a lot of paperwork. Uh, personally, I, I think the paperwork is reasonable and but then I've come from that system. So I'm happy to work with anybody, member or not, working in this sector uh, to help them go through their paperwork and help them report back. Um, I think there is uh, a bunch of changes coming to some of the agriculture funding over the next little while that will have different reporting uh, requirements. And certainly in our relationship with ITI, we've been told that they're very aware of it and are interested in uh, making it a, an easier process for people as well. Thank you, Ms. Dean. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. <coughs> um, my, my next question, I guess, relates to uh, something that MLA not could be referenced, and that is our very limited time frame that we have left within, within this term. And while we both committees have recognized this as a very important um, issue they want to address and want to provide recommendations to the government through the House, um, we're not going to solve all of the challenges in the next seven months uh, that food security presents to the Northwest Territories. And so one of the things I just wanted to say is, I guess, a strong recommendation to also kind of um, provide this information to the next incoming uh, MLAs or people that are running uh, so that as soon as the next government starts, when they're starting to think of what legislation to potentially put forward, that some of this stuff can very much make it onto that radar. Uh, because although, you know, if, if this committee provide, or these committees, sorry, provide recommendations that have to do with legislation, it might not necessarily make it in and, and definitely not make it done within the life of this assembly. So I just wanted to kind of add that as a comment. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anything to add? Uh... No, thank you. So a uh, suggestion we'll take to heart and work very hard to make sure the information is shared. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the members? Uh, Mr. O'Reilly. 
was trying to figure out which ones are going to go. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Um, one of the things, I, I guess I got two things I want to ask you about, but the first one is uh, whenever I've asked uh, ITI, uh, which seems to have most of the responsibility for supporting uh, um, agriculture, uh, food production, so on, there doesn't seem to be any stats kept on, on food production here. Uh, you know, um, in terms of what we produce locally, what we you know, consume uh, that's local or from outside. And if you don't have stats, how can you actually um, measure the effectiveness of support or programs? And I, uh, I don't know what ITI requires in terms of its contribution agreements, and we don't want to be too onerous in terms of uh, the money that's given out, but it would be helpful to know uh, more about how much of our food is actually locally produced, what percentage and different kinds of food, calorie values. There's a whole bunch of things that we just don't know about. Uh, so anyways, I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions, recommendations around um, data collection and tracking this stuff so that we can actually start to set some more meaningful targets and better evaluate the effectiveness of supports that GMWT offers, with, which probably aren't that great. But why don't we start with that? Thanks. Mr. Riley, Ms. Dean. Thank you. It's, we fundamentally support the idea of statistics and data collection, absolutely. Um, so I appreciate your observation there. Um, it, the, the NWT Bureau of Stats, even when they talk about employment in the agriculture sector, our numbers are so low that it reports a zero, um, which is just not acceptable. So yes, we need to work harder on that. We do believe that that data is available, um, and we are looking to do that data collection ourselves uh, with the information from the sector information, and then we hope that our ITI partners can help us with some of the government level information that they may have access to, such as um, what are the key foods being purchased under um, subsidized food programs and things like that. That would also be good information for our members so that they know what areas are in demand. Um, but certainly we collect information from the farmers markets, for example, and from some of our other members, and we can continue to do that. Excuse me. Sorry, Ms. Dean. Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah, sorry. It's been a very long day for us already. Uh, and uh, I probably will yawn at some point as well. So, uh, And it's not lack of interest, let me tell you that. So uh, um, I guess my other question is, you know, um, I actually drafted a motion on food security, like getting, developing a food security strategy. Uh, and it was passed unanimously by the regular MLAs. And it, but it called for things like, you know, having a, a, a minister responsible for food security, um, developing better data collection, uh, setting targets, and, uh, you know, uh, there was a bunch, it was pretty comprehensive, and I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, but um, the response we got back from the government was, uh, thanks very much, we're going to hire a food security person and we're going to park them in. HSS, uh, sorry, uh, Health and Social Services, and uh, by the way, we're doing all this stuff, which I'm not going to, I think parts of it they're doing, but it's totally uncoordinated. you got different departments doing different things, they don't even know what, what each other is doing, um, no coordination of supports, uh, no um, tracking, anyway, it's not good. So anyways, I'm just wondering if you've had a a chance to look at that motion, if you have any suggestions for how this government's clearly not going to do a food security strategy, so any thoughts on what a strategy might actually look like and what kind of finance, uh, financial resources are necessary to actually carry it out. And this feeds into what my colleague talked about in getting this a priority for the next government because it should be, in my opinion. But. Leave it at that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Randy, Ms. Dean. Thank you. I don't know that I can answer everything that you're asking tonight, <laughs> but 
I can tell you that uh, I certainly have looked at the strategy. I think we, as an association, feel that food production in the north is much more important than it's been given credit for. And I think it's uh, very easy to subsidize food coming from elsewhere, but it doesn't address the supply chain issues. And we think that it's so food production, but also restaurants and it just creating markets for our food producers, all of that is such an integrated part of food security that it often gets dropped off the table for some of the social issues that come to play, which are important. We're not saying they're not important. So that's why collaboration is fundamental in any approach that we take. So absolutely, um, we think that food is the center of food insecurity. Um, but in terms of what would it cost and what some of the suggestions are, uh, we could certainly put that together, put information together, come up and say this is what we would recommend. Excuse me, we can do the jurisdictional scan to say here's what they look like elsewhere. We can do that work um, to give a little bit more of concrete terms or concrete expectations. Um, if that's if that would help the next group moving forward, so we're not we're not adverse to doing the work. Thank you, Mr. Steve. Mr. O'Reilly, one more. Uh, thanks, I appreciate that, and um, I think if you can, if you want to provide an extra uh, any additional thoughts coming away from this, I think that would be helpful for us in maybe formulating some recommendations and little bits of wisdom we can pass on to whoever follows us. So thanks. Thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Riley. I'll let you reply if you'd like to reply, Christine. So, no, it could be. Thank you. I just thought of something here, and also uh, Jane is listening and messaging. <laughs> so, just curious to know a little bit more about what um, is happening with the collaboration with Indigenous governments and and around that sort of um, harvesting and and foraging maybe type uh, agriculture sector, and and how do we sort of see that moving forward? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think we're early on in the relationships that we need to have and I think we need to do a much more active job in, um, in making those relationships with Indigenous governments recognize that it's okay to talk about food and that we need to talk about food. We certainly stay connected, we communicate, we advocate uh, wherever we can. Um, we celebrate the successes of things like the Country Foods Program in Inuvik. Um, there's been a lot of research done in the north uh, with like market gardens in, um, within indigenous community or get with indigenous government partners. But I think that research isn't necessarily staying and it's not necessarily being shared. And that's a role that we think we can help with um, so that when we have a success story in a community because a research partners come in and worked with a local government, then we want to be able to share that elsewhere. We can do that. Uh, but certainly we're early on in those relationships and we shouldn't be, uh, but it is a key priority for us to be better. Thank you, Ms. Dean. One short follow-up, uh, Ms. Caitlin, uh, Ms. Uh, not to be, sorry. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with that, and I hope that the, part of the plan is to send invitations specifically to them all for the conference. And I also want to say I do remember a 1930s uh, Film Board of Canada uh, video where they're growing um, cabbage about this big, a giant mine uh, in the, the town site. So it's been going on at least since the 30s, so I, I do agree with that. So thank you. Uh, the only thing I want 1842, first recorded garden in the NWT. <laughs> Okay, thank you for your presentation. If there's no other questions, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, your time here tonight and, uh, and helping us uh, move forward to uh, address. address our uh, issues that we have. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, the uh, we do have another caller online that um, if uh, you could Disidentify yourself. Hello, is that oh. uh, is that is it my turn? Get you're coming up there shortly. Uh, oh, okay. No, where somebody called in on a, on a cell phone. Yeah. Oh, that could be me. This is Lisa Thurber. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. 
Okay, after um, next on the list we have uh, Francois Bennett, Refuge Yep. France Benoit. France Benoit. Okay, we we. Yeah. Next time you you say. Okay. We oui, we. Oui. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the meeting tonight. Hello. Um, I have a, prepared uh, some notes for this presentation, and uh, unfortunately is, has been lost somewhere in the world for the last four days with my luggage with Air Canada. So <laughs> I quickly gathered some, some thoughts uh, together. First, I would like to introduce myself. I'm the owner-operator of Le Refuge Farm in Yellowknife. I'm one of the co-founder with Amy of the Yellowknife Farmers Market. Um, I developed the idea of a harvester's table at the, the farmer's market where people can bring their excess produce to, to sell. Um, backyard gardeners, uh, I mean. And, uh, and I want my legacy to be that I helped uh, grow another generation of farmers in the Northwest Territories. I believe wholeheartedly that to be truly sovereign, we need to be able to feed ourselves. It's that basic. We are incredibly lucky uh, to have land, water, country food, fish here in the Northwest Territories. And um, I would like tonight uh, to give you some context for the decisions and the suggestions that you will be putting forward um, on food security. Um, I will start by making very clear my bias on this. I am of the opinion that food security is not a food issue. I repeat, food security is not a food issue. It's a money problem. We waste 40 to 60 percent of our food at all stages, from in the field uh, to the distribution center to transportation to the grocery store to our fridges. So there is food. There is plenty of food. The sad part is that many people cannot afford to buy the food. <clears throat> the single most important thing we can do is, in my opinion, to recommend a universal basic income so that everybody has the chance to buy healthy and culturally appropriate food at the local store and maybe um, uh, for them to be able to participate in the growing and the fishing and the trapping and the hunting and the processing of the food. Um, so most of you are aware there is an online forum on um, put together by Alternatives North and uh, uh, on the 15th, and I'd like to um, encourage you to uh, look at all the benefits of a universal basic income for the Northwest Territories. And I will leave it at that because there are people much more expert on the topic to, to speak about this. But to me, food security, if you're really serious about it, that's what we need to do. Um, climate change is the other big factor which I feel is critical to food security. Um, I, I try to remain hopeful, but I do not think that my food is going to be coming from BC and California for much longer. Uh, we just have to look at the wildfires and droughts, California, BC. Um, we can no longer assume that that's where our food is going to be coming from. So where is it going to be coming from? I'm just back from uh, visiting family in Quebec and gone are the fields of my youth and uh, their Amazon distribution center which ship food now so <laughs> the irony of it all uh, big agri corporations are ahead of the game and they're right now uh, buying land in Africa left right and center um, there are places in the states where they can no longer grow wheat because it's too hot um, if we do not support land and water for food in the Northwest Territory. Somebody else is going to come and do it for us in the foreseeable future. Um, production is moving north, so that's a great potential uh, to us. And if we don't do it, somebody else will come and do it for us. And we're not necessarily going to like the consequences. If we are to support the growing or the processing of food here, priority should be given to some of what Janet said about uh, calorie nutrient dense foods like fish, eggs, country food, root vegetables. They bring calories. 
Human beings on average need about 2,000 calories. So that's a lot of lettuce. And I'm assuming we don't want to eat a lot of 2,000 calories of lettuce every day. Um, so to me, every project should be evaluated through the lens of how many calories they are provided, providing per dollar. Um, uh, I always get, you know, sometimes people in Yellowknife have Inuvik community greenhouse envy and there seems to be, you know, every time people say, oh, we need a big, a big one of those in Yellowknife. Well, it probably made sense for Inuvik, but to have a big, huge structure in Yellowknife to grow tomatoes would be great, but that's not going to feed us. And I think that's where we're at. We need to feed ourselves. Um, uh, potatoes, leeks, leek potato soup. Every country in Europe <laughs> has been living on that. Carrots, beets, cabbages, that's what we could be growing. But there is much less money in that, and we need to, to recognize that. And yet, they are much cheaper to grow. So there's the other great uh, irony. Um, I would say do not be afraid to incentivize production. There's this great fear in government that we can't give to one industry what we can't give to all the other ones. Um, what we need, you know, what we do for one, we need to do for all the industries. And another one of my biases is I will not apologize for the fact that feeding ourselves to me should be in a separate category. You cannot use the same evaluation criteria for a drywalling company that you do for a food base project, <laughs> you know, and uh, to me, we, we can move ahead with low-tech solutions to growing and processing food in the north due to the high um, fuel costs and heating um, and all of that. Um, there should be a food component to everything that GNWT is doing. So you're planning a building, there should be a food component to it. Mining reclamation. Now you're going to go, what is she, where is she going with this? Um, con mine used to have con gardens. Families were fed on gardens at con mine. And I, uh, at my first farm, was growing food upside down. So why can't we grow food upside down on sites that have already been cleared, <laughs> and so we don't have to destroy forests to uh, to grow food. And you know, when I'm in hope, a hopeful place, I think of con mine, and maybe we could one day again grow food there. And what a great reconciliation with the land to be able to grow food uh, on reclaimed sites. Uh, the lowest hanging fruit, excuse the pun, um, is to me, to throw this, our support behind already existing commercial food growers. That's the best bet, the best uh, bang for our bucks. And from a government point of view, the question should be, how much do you need and what barriers can we remove for you to do what you want to do? And the, the most important thing should be to increase local food production. Um, so that restaurants serve local food, so that public institutions serve um, local food. But first, we need to increase local food production. And if the programs don't fit, then we need to change the programs. So 10 years ago, when we started the farmer's market, I couldn't get a penny from the government because I was too small scale. So spent a lot of time trying to change the programs. How can one get big scale if you can, you know, if you don't start small scale? So you know, now things are um, a little better. Uh, we also need to, and some other thoughts that came to me while listening to the other uh, uh, speaker is to um, the role of the environmental health office. Some of my I think, best ideas to diversify and expand my business died on the floor <laughs> of the EHO. So there's a lot of, and I, I understand the, about food safety, but um, as to why every strand of kale sold needs to have somebody's address attached to it so that, you know, I guess the, 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 the logic is if there's food poisoning that we know exactly where the kale is coming from. 
Um, I think there are things that could be streamlined um, around that, and we're in discussion with um, uh, with the AHO. Um, so very often people, you know, run ideas and projects uh, by me, and for expanding their business or starting a business. And the first thing I say is, talk to the AHO first of all. And uh, yeah. Um, another thing that I want to, to touch on because it was mentioned is around, um, I'm going to call it accountability for funding received from the GNWT. I've been at it for a while and the last little bit, the amount of scrutiny and accountability asked of people receiving relatively small amounts of money um, and I'm speaking now as, uh, with the, the farmer's market, it was, it was a part-time job for me over a certain number of months. And I'm a volunteer, <laughs> but this was, um, I had to educate staff on certain issue. I was asked to provide um, backup information. Um, the amount of work required um, was disheartening uh, at times. Um, I think I will leave it at that. I think we have a great potential to turn um, things around. And if we do it here, we have such a diversified population of sort of, you know, small urban and the communities, indigenous population, the country food. If we can do this here, we can have the world look at us and how we've done it, like serious. We start this and we do it good, the UN is gonna be here looking at how we're doing this. There we go. So any questions from the members? Caitlin? Oh, it's good. Yeah. Two, questions, two questions. Plastic bottle one? Yeah. yeah. Recyclable plastic bottle water. <laughs> Somewhere. Yeah. I'll give you one of these later. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation and for pulling your notes together again under, I'm sure, lots of stress while you're coming here. No, I, I appreciate it. I very much appreciate it. Um, I, I wanted to start off by saying I, I did receive the invitation to the Alternatives North Forum. I believe we all did. Uh, one of the things yeah, that happens, yeah, it's during session. <laughs> so during, yeah, hopefully we can uh, access that afterwards because un unfortunately I find during session we like to try to be in two places at once and we just haven't mastered that yet. Um, I know, I know. But um, the other thing that I was wondering, and I have, I'm, I'm very happy that you brought up the accountability for funding piece because that is something that I have heard. And I have heard people actually say, I'm not going to apply for that. I, it's offered to me, but the amount of people hours it will take to accommodate the reporting is not worth the money that I will receive. I'm far better off actually just going and working extra hours than tearing my hair out over the reporting requirements. And so I was happy to hear that. And I'm wondering if um, any of the people that you have heard from or yourself have had the opportunity to provide that feedback through either the GNWT or the Red Tape Working Group. Thank you. Ms. Uh, it did on a personal basis with a Red Tape um, Group. I was encouraged to do that. Um, through the farmer's market, it's on my to-do list to, uh, to do, yeah. Um, and reapplying this year, things appear to be um, a little smoother. So we will see, but that's, it's more in the reporting um, stage, uh, you know, that, uh, yeah, there was a lot of scrutiny. And I think maybe before, there may not have been as much. Um, and, and now it's, you know, so it's the pendulum kind of thing. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Benoit. Ms. Cleveland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, just going back to the, the comments about the low-hanging fruit and, and really throwing support behind existing growers in the territory with a goal of, of increasing local food production, uh, one of the things mentioned was sitting down with people and identifying what those barriers are. And, and one of them that was identified here today for, for food growers 
um, were things like uh, like the accountability framework and then also it sounds like uh, access to land as well might be one of them at, a, at an afford, affordable access to land. Are there other barriers that um, you yourself have heard from either your, your colleagues or through your own experience that would be a, a barriers that could be addressed in the seven months that we have left in this term? Thank there, you. Uh, Employment um, area. I know that at some point I looked at programs through ECE uh, that were um, seasonal, blah, blah, blah. So I had great hopes. But apparently those are not for gardeners and farmers. Those were for ice road truckers in winter. <laughs> so I thought seasonal should be seasonal. So there was no opening at that point for um, um, some of the employment programs to be used for seasonal part-time uh, job. Um, the way I worked around it was to ask ITI, and I put together at length of time, a mentorship program. So I was able to provide a mentorship which provided me with somebody um, to to help with uh, with my farm. In fact, it was five people that uh, I I mentored, um, and that was a big surprise because I was looking for one person, and I had five applications that were I felt outstanding, and I offered them each a day, <laughs> and they came for uh, for a day. So that was another light bulb. It's like obviously there's some people out there that are um, interested, but it's such small scale for um, the owner and for the, the contractor. Um, you know, thank God some young people are still interested in working one day a week on a farm and people like me who are at a different stage in life where, um, you know, I don't have a young family to, to feed <laughs> and so I can um, undertake these, um, these projects to, you know, to mentor and, and so on. But not everybody is in the position to do that. So that's where I was going with supporting already existing commercial food growers. They're already in place. Um, it takes so much time and effort and, and money and dedication and energy to, to start. So once the momentum is there, once they've started, to continue to push them along. So how can we help you increase your production? Thank you, Ms. Benoit. Thank you, Ms. Sleeper. Any other questions? Ms. Thong. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation as well. And I would not have guessed that you had just thrown your notes back together again for if you hadn't told us. I know that you're speaking to something that you really care about. So and it's always much, it's there. You live it and you breathe it. So, um, you know, when I, again, coming back to my time as a minister at one point, I, and the COVID had started, I really, I had this idea I was that everybody should just get seeds because so many people were talking about their gardening. And I don't know if it was just by saying seeds that I got ITI all mixed up with their funding uh, program seed, but it was like the most impossible thing. And I was literally said, all I want you to do is just give people seeds because so many people wanted to start a garden that summer and it went nowhere. So, um, but I look at things where like for myself, I've had, I have a yard, but I have no time, no effort, no knowledge, no anything. And I've often thought, how do I find somebody who lives in an apartment nearby that does have all of that want and, and, and sort of what you were doing on your own farm, but I'm wondering if there's a way or possibility through the association, which I'm sure you're very uh, connected with as well, um, to you know connect or create sort of this network or web of people that want to sort of farm share. I don't know if that's the way you would put it, but well, land okay. okay, land share. So yeah, maybe if you could speak a little bit more to that and if that's maybe coming up and in the works yeah. and I offer up my yard, so anybody it's, listening. Um, Thank you, uh, Ms. Nakovi, Ms. Benoit. Um, two things I'll say about that. We call that a land share um, program. So it's typical in many, with around many farmers markets or uh, organizations where they connect people like you that have land but no expertise or no time with people that, that wish to do that. Um, so we certainly tried that at the beginning and we found that we couldn't be a good 
intermediary because Yellowknife being small scale, that was done word of mouth at the water cooler at the office. So we were hearing of people <laughs> connecting, but it was not necessarily through us. But the program is still there and, and, and so on. So through the harvester stable, we greatly expanded this year with funding from ITI, um, a much broader project. So we had 28 inspired backyard gardeners coming to bring their excess produce at the market. We hired somebody that we called a garden angel. Isn't that the best summer job title ever? <laughs> so this garden angel was um, uh, connect, uh, going to people's yard to collect. People would bring their, um, their produce. Uh, we had some um, downtown location, big, large beds that were uh, provided to us. So we, I think, quadrupled the amount of produce brought to the market. But it quadrupled the amount of work necessary. So, and that was part of the difficulty in the, in the reporting. It was just so much. And for EHO purposes, every strand of everything brought needed to be recorded. So you're talking about a large amount of work and time. Hence the realization the low-hanging fruit is to, first of all, we're not going to let go of these people, and we're going to continue to offer that next year, but the low-hanging fruit is to support the already existing commercial food grower, because they've got more volume. So for the same amount of time, you get more. And so that's sort of where we're at. So this year for the Harvester Stable, we are um, hoping to be going through that route. But we're not going to let go as well of the backyard gardeners. Um, and you know, we're going to see what we can do to try to streamline all the, the paperwork. Because essentially, we have hired staff for which we need to get funding <laughs> to, to do all of the paperwork for funding programs. Essentially, that's what we have. And so we're contemplating. You know, maybe we can just have tables there and people put down their produce and people pick produce and we have a donation box. Would that, right. would that work? <laughs> you know? So I'm going to ask the EHO <laughs> if that is, is possible, but certainly we would save a lot of money and, and time. Yeah. Just quickly, um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, there's oh, that's we hear this across the board in every sort of uh, time we have any kind of committee that the the paperwork and the hoops and jumping through and proving everything is is so burdensome and I guess I have to say as someone coming from the private sector I never thought I would say this but I, I actually now after three years support a universal basic income because of the fact that I see how much time and effort and money and man are person power, et cetera, is all spent on just literally people filling out forms and jumping through hoops that don't have the capacity, time, effort, or will to do it. So more of a comment, I, everything you're saying, I think is very much resonating with us. So thank you. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Nockaby. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, Mr. O'Reilly? Um, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, maybe not so much. I guess there's a, maybe one question, but uh, in full disclosure, we consider France a personal friend, so um, visited her on her two farms that she's helped, uh, three farms, yeah, that she's helped establish. She turned a, a gravel <laughs> yard in Cam Lake into a productive farm that's still in operation with some other operators. So, um, yeah, I, anyways, I, I want to encourage you that if Air Canada hasn't given away your luggage yet, um, that uh, you submit any notes that you, you do have because I think we this is something we're going to take a bit of time to look at so if you want to submit notes after this uh, and, uh, that, that would be helpful I think for us um, I guess I wanted uh, you know you've related a lot of experience and I know that you have a lot of uh, first hand knowledge and experience with GNWT funding programs and some of the frustrations there one of the things that cabinet has done is they are going to set up this, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but a, an NGO or not-for-profit sector external advisory committee, and they, they called for people to sit on it. So I, I don't know if anybody from the agricultural world or food security world submitted their names, but I think it'd be really helpful if 
somebody with some of those kinds of experience if you can't sit on it at least pass on some of the wisdom to that that group when they they get going but um i guess uh um i want to ask you like we did pass this motion in the in the assembly here i don't know if you had a chance to look at it and i, I think you've given me some thoughts about what should be in a food security strategy moving forward and what the uh, uh, you know in terms of some priorities you know supporting um, existing commercial producers focusing on calorie value uh, you know you've, you've given us I think some really uh, helpful suggestions but um, anything else you want to pass along because uh, we may not all be sitting around the table uh, uh, past October uh, and I would encourage you to you folks to work together to ensure that this is a priority for the next assembly so uh, any other wisdom you want to pass along in terms of priorities or how to get this done. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Benoit. The issue is not going to go away. Um, it's only going to get worse, um, I think. Um, Ten years ago when we started the farmer's market, there was a, a decision to be made as to, you know, at that point I was the only one that was coming to the market with produce. and. So do we start the market and hope that this will inspire an increase in local food production, or do we not start the market and focus on increasing local food production? Um, and I think we made the right decision in, in getting the farmer's market um, going. And, and now I think we really need to concentrate on increasing that uh, local food production. Yeah. That, any other questions, Mr. Riley? Hearing none, any other questions from the members? Thank you so much for your presentation you. tonight. Next on the list we have, uh, on Zoom, we have Mrs. Miss Lafferty, and then uh, in the room with us we have Mrs. Uh, Arlene Hashi, uh, the National Indigenous Housing Network of Keepers of the Circle. Welcome, ladies. Miss Lafferty, are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Ms. Hashi. Okay, so start in or? Yes, start your presentation. Okay. Uh, so Lisa's here on the phone with us and Arlene is in person. Um, our group is currently working on setting up an Indigenous Housing Foundation in the NWT. Um, and as we know, nutrition plays a huge part in the everyday living of our residents and it is part of the wraparound support services that we talk about when we talk about the need for improved housing. So while the GNWT points to high transportation costs, rising food prices and changing environmental conditions as primary contributors to food insecurity in the north, a more reflective approach is required. It is the entrenchment of colonial systems that perpetuate intergenerational poverty, lack of economic opportunity, and the erasure of Indigenous ways of knowing and being that is at the root of food insecurity among Indigenous peoples in the North. Ignoring these critical factors has led to superficial responses to this crisis that we're talking about right now, and costly government-controlled programs that have minimal positive impact on Northern families and communities who are majority Indigenous population, with settlers being in the driver's seat, and this needs to stop. Aboriginal food security in Northern Canada, an assessment of the State of Knowledge report, identified an information gap in lived Northern experience and traditional knowledge that is necessary to define and address the issues surrounding Northern food security. They paired the concepts of food security with so food sovereignty as essential to moving forward through Indigenous legal orders and principles found in UNDRIP. The GNWT has a fiduciary duty to provide assistance to Indigenous peoples in need. Child apprehension is a part of food sovereignty. Child apprehension is happening at alarming rates in the North for instances of poverty being flagged as neglect. A child not having food to eat at home is not a reason to apprehend them. It is not neglect. More funding needs to be given to Indigenous nonprofit organizations to provide food vouchers or gift cards to families so that they're not going hungry. Until these long-term measures 
can be put in place, temporary programs need to be resourced. A territory-wide healthy school food program needs to be put into place immediately with priority on the remote communities for the prevention of long-term health-related impacts like diabetes and the prevention of tooth decay and immediate needs because we have families that are starving. All kids in Canada and the North deserve healthy food every day in school. Traditional knowledge represents a way of life, but traditional knowledge of the local environment combined with the related skill sets of harvesting, traveling on the land, water, food processing can all be understood as a set of cultural practices necessary for food security and food sovereignty as an inherent and asserted Aboriginal right. It is a law. The extent to which this knowledge is transmitted to future generations plays an important role in determining the health and wellness of individuals and communities to revitalize food sovereignty and prosper through food manufacturing and distribution through a social enterprise, but the government is not working with our communities to support these opportunities. Traditional knowledge has always been guided and guiding the lives of Northern Indigenous peoples and a growing number of Canadian and international community-based programs participatory research projects are making valuable contributions to food security research. Currently, a total of $330,000 in funding is set aside for regional harvesting, a training and mentorship program, a pilot program for trapper mentorship, and assisting families to go out on the land. We request that that budget be radically increased, and we'll tell you why in, the, in a minute. An increase must also be allocated to the small-scale foods program to assist in the non-commercial growing and production of food in each of the regions of the territory. This program helps underserved remote communities and organizations operating within them to get the resources they need to support and promote local agriculture, such as greenhouses and community gardens across the north. We're asking, or rather we are demanding, that the GNWT lobby the federal government to increase the flexibility of Nutrition North programs so Northerners see a greater benefit, one that is designed and managed by the Indigenous nations of the NWT who are in the position to do this work effectively for the betterment of our communities. Many Indigenous residents in housing are unable to afford groceries. After paying the rent and their utility bills, they rely on family and friends to provide traditional foods or else they literally are going hungry. Harvesting programs need to be supplemented seasonally across the North as an Aboriginal right. Once again, this is a law that needs to be upheld by the leaders of the GNWT. Subsidized food vouchers are not working. The Northern stores and other food providers need to be placed under independent review. Transport companies shipping in food are being paid out the subsidies when they should be going to the people living in communities. So who really is reaping the benefits of the food subsidy programs? When food subsidies are provided to residents, there is a category of non-perishable and perishables and low, medium, high subsidies which need to be under review as well as consulted on in the remote communities of what's working and what's not working for the people. The subsidies also cannot be taken as income, which is then taken out of social assistance pay payouts. Food banks need to be funded in every single community. Churches are helping to provide food vouchers where there is gaps for residents, but it's not reaching the masses, and many Indigenous peoples are not inclined to ask for anything from the church, considering the history of the residential schools. So we cannot rely on the church to be providing us food. There are innovative designs that are proven to grow vegetables in minus 40. We need to start incorporating community gardens with the technologies available to us to be able to have year-round access to free nutritional foods, which, ne which needs to be collectively looked at and supported with Indigenous na nations leading that economic opportunity. The NWT has the potential to test these forward-thinking concepts, yet seems to always be fearful to take risks and place power in the hands of the Indigenous peoples to lead the way, and that is why the NWT is still behind the rest of the country in so many ways, and the North actually looks very shameful on an international scale when we see photos of ludicrous prices in the Arctic communities. New up-and-coming food security associations and existing food growers and the NWT need to ensure they are working with the nations, as well as providing the section 35 right because this is about land transport and land access and a cooperative solution is possible one that is only done by being indigenous led in the nwt indigenous nations are fully capable of doing this work which provides communities with job security which is something that people are complaining that there are not enough jobs well this is a perfect opportunity to provide those jobs 
and with the funding to support required to feed our families in an assertion again of Aboriginal rights that the GNWT has a fiduciary duty to accommodate as this money is being distributed by the federal government. So the very fact that the GNWT is asking tonight what the stats are around food security is disturbing because the debt that the departments should have these numbers and you should be fully aware of what these numbers are. Also, having the GNWT step in and shut down local Indigenous businesses like the Buffalo Farm in Fort Liard that was fully supported by the nation should be a crime. That business could have used ITI support. And this goes back to the Royal Proclamation of the 1700s, which states that Indigenous peoples cannot prosper off their own land. So I ask you, what year are we living in right now? We're in 2023. We're not in the 1700s anymore. We have families that are literally starving and our people are trying to do something about it, but being stopped at every angle. So you're sitting around the table saying that you're tired tonight, but you have a job to do. She done? She's still in the call. She was cut off. Okay. She's still in the call. Okay. No, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you, Masi Cho. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Ms. Hashi. Do you have anything else to add? I was going to uh, allow Lisa Thurber to take it if she's if she's on the line. So. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Hashi. Ms. Lisa? Ms. Thurber, you there? Okay, so I'll just focus on two areas. One, uh, oops, sorry. I just want to let that young presenter there, Miss uh, Lafferty, know we're not the government. We're holding the government accountable for what what we're trying to do here with you guys tonight. So just let it be known, we're not the government. We're holding the government accountable to provide food services and that for the people of our community. So I live it too, just like you. I see people that are going without, kids are being taken away. Yeah, I, you you hit a lot of uh, points there in regards to your presentation. But we are here to help and try to work with you guys to hold our government accountable to provide service to the people that we represent. So I just want to make that clear. We're not the government, we're holding them accountable. And my committee's are hard work. My you committee, no, excuse me. You are the government. Well, I'm not. The, we're, I'm not the government. You get paid by the. GMT. I'm a legislator. Yeah, I'm a legislator. I'm not yeah, the government. Not I'm not part of the government. And so, Lisa does have something to say. But I'm just making it clear that what uh, just hear what we're saying too. We're listening to you. Have the respect to listen back. Thank you. I am respecting you and I am listening to you, but I'm also saying that you get a government paycheck. So you are a government and you are responsible and accountable to the constituents of the NWT. To my... Yeah, thank you. Okay. Who do we have on... Uh... Lisa Thurbert, you're there? You ready, early? Just if it comes on, I can stop. <laughs> Hello? Can, can anybody hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Go ahead. Uh, in Hay River, um, my mother was a residential school survivor. My first home was in Enterprise, and I used to catch the bus from Enterprise all the way to Old Town when the school was back in Old Town. And by the time I got to school, I was hungry. It, you know, it was a good 45 to 50 minutes on that bus ride. And although I had an early breakfast, I'd be hungry. By the time I got home, I was hungry. I was hungry during school. I was so hungry as a child that speaking about it now brings saliva into my mouth to where I was so sick. And an easy solution to help do some of this food security and literally put food into people's mouths and to children's mouths is to provide school food programs across the NWT. 
it is trying to be worked on across Canada. I would like to see this government, whoever you are, whatever committee we are seeing, whoever is responsible for that fiduciary responsibility to literally start putting your money where your mouth is and that and food into the mouths of our children and to every resident. We have 45,000 residents in the territories and not one of us can go without food. And I'm going to hand it over to Arlene now um, and to continue from there. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Sasha. <clears throat> There's two areas that I thought I could focus on and one is, uh, first of all, thanking the previous presenters because they were just super and uh, so, so expert in you know their particular area and one of the areas I wanted to focus on was the guaranteed basic income and I know I don't need to educate any of you on what that is and many of you supported it going back to how difficult it is to make the government accountable when there just is no political will to get the job done so I just wanted to lay out that poverty for Indigenous people is intergenerational and directly linked to historic and present day colonial systems that have engaged in genocide through dispossession, displacement and disempowerment. Melissa Britton and Cindy Blackstock described the relationship between the two as the deliber deliberate impoverishment of Indigenous Canada or poverty by design. The policies, practice, and outcomes, and, and outcomes of this uh, state-inspired design are detailed in the TRC report and the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls report. And so a response to this, this crisis is required immediately. So of course I've got the stats in front of me and I'll share them with you in writing just to uh, not take up so much time, but suffice, suffice it to say, it was residents in the Clincho communities that are particularly hard hit with poverty and lack of access to uh, food. Uh, other communities as well, Polituk, Uluktuk, Jean Marie, all talked about needing to go to their relatives for financial help. So I sort of side with France in saying this is a money issue and an intergenerational money issue. It can be solved. And many of you at this table have uh, supported it. And your government or the government is not uh, following suit. So uh, we're calling for a guaranteed basic income. Um, the other thing I think is really critical to add to that is a living wage, not a, min a minimum wage, because employers are also responsible to make sure their employees are making a, a fair wage. And I remember uh, the, Wal uh, no, was it Walmart? No, the co-op was doing a food bank drive and there was a big picture up there and they were saying, oh, if you, if you donate, uh, buy so much food, we'll donate or something like that. And I said, I might donate, but I want you to tell me you pay your workers a living wage. That's what I want you to tell me. And the backlash I got from government employees who make a damn good wage, in my opinion, for, for having that expectation and not being nice and not, and not buying into the nice food bank idea was pretty huge. So no, employers have an obligation to pay their workers in the Northwest Territories a living wage. And then I would bring that to where does the government fit into that expectation? The government, I remember the YWCA did a study that showed uh, nonprofit, uh, nonprofit workers make I think it was 60% of what government workers make, you know, across the sector. And the YWCA lobbied the government to, uh, in funding agreements, make sure where they could pay their workers 80% of what government workers make. And that was written off, not possible. And when you're looking at the new NGO relationship, like get real about wages in this territory, uh, particularly in, in small communities outside of Yellowknife. Uh, the other thing I just kind of want to be cautious about is I remember, you know, in my days of advocacy, I'm still there, but uh, telling parents to make sure their kids ate food at school. Make sure you get that food, make sure you eat it, send your kids there, blah, blah, blah. And some of the schools call child welfare to report those parents going too often to get food and, you know, what's up with these parents and that kind of thing. And that really does go back to why it's so critical. Community people run their own programs not not uh, uh, 
people with a colonial framework. And I just want to make sure I covered it all. Ah, end, sorry, ending the Serb clawback. The Serb clawback is devastating for many people across the North. Again, you probably know all about it, so I won't uh, give you the details, except to say, in the territories, end that clawback. And can you, yeah, in the territories you can when it comes to income support and when it comes to uh, students who are impacted negatively by that, uh, that uh, thing. And then the 10-year infrastructure agreement allocated $26 million in 2022-2023 to address loss of priorities. One of those priorities was food security. So my question is, is what they spend it on? Was anything of that infrastructure spent on food security or food insecurity? And so, and now we have many years to go because that infrastructure fund goes right to 2028. And there's millions and millions of dollars in that. So allocate that infrastructure money to, to addressing this. And I think I will leave it at that, except to say I'll give you one hope. I mean, I think, like when you come with solutions, we presented solutions. They're there. I'll give you one final solution that's just kind of the most recent glorious experience I've had. And that is working with uh, training Indigenous women to design and build their own house and attaching food security to that house and sustainable energy or low energy to that house. And we have a concrete on the ground example of where an Indigenous woman got her house, elders gifted her land, and she is fully sustainable. And uh, she uh, didn't have to pay a penny for that damn house. And so people were complaining, why her? Why did she get a free house? I said, I'm not going to cry tears in my beer if the federal government gave an Indigenous woman a free house. So things are possible in the Northwest Territories. Yeah, that's what I would say. So I'll end it on that. Oh, I would like the environmental health officer to quit focusing on kale and focus on mold and bed bugs. <laughs> Thank you. We agree with you. Yeah. A lot of members agree with you with that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Arlene, for your presentation. And uh, Ms. Lafferty, thank you for your presentation. And uh, Ms. Thurber, thank you. Um, any questions from the members? OK. Jane. Yeah, hopes. OK. Well, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I hear um, Ms. Lafferty, her presentation, because uh, we've been, you know, that's nothing new. It's, it's happening all over the Northwest Territories, and it's not just in certain communities. Poverty is everywhere. It's already written in our 2018 status report, and that's why I ran, because I don't like the system. And so, so that's why I'm glad she mentioned it because in the 2018 health status report, I'm so grateful that whoever, you know, uh, suggested that the data to be, you know, to be brought forward. And I heard it was Mr. O'Reilly. So thank you. <laughs> that you know, like I heard it from somebody else that said that because of Kevin, all those status report, you know, health status report of the um, of the in, um, the. In, of the regions in the north. So even in Klitschko region, we have the highest, um, everything in Klitschko region, we have the worst of everything. We have the worst of education, we have the worst of housing, we have the wor high unemployment rate, we have a lot of people on income support, everything, we have the highest rate of uh, mental health issues, health, um, food security, addictions, you name it, we are in it. And it's not just my community, it's not just in my regions, it's all over. So I wanna you know, um, t uh, make highlight of that. That is why I'm very grateful, whoever, um, I don't know where it came from, but I know the school, when I was there, I know the school was receiving some foods, healthy food, some fresh fruit. So um, I know that, I, um, I'm just wondering if um, your department or whoever is providing these um, healthy food or fresh food, if you guys are um, going to other flying communities as well. Is it just in Klitschko region or is it because we're too cold, we're closed, 
that you have, you know, because of transportation, or like to tuck, you know, like I mean, they're going through the same thing in uh, in his regions and in South too, you know. So there are other regions. I'm just wondering if you guys are reaching out to other people, other um, indigenous communities as well in the regions. Thank. You. Thank you for your comments, Masashi. Go ahead. I'm not connected to the Food First uh, organization, but there is a Food First organization. I know they access funding for different schools, and I'm just not sure if it covers all of the territories or how much food is uh, kind of on the table for children going to school, or yeah, going to school. So I'm just not sure what the status of that is. Thank you, Sasha. Next on this Ms. Green. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I was very intrigued by the conversation about Nutrition North, and we had the uh, opportunity to speak with Nutrition North at a previous panel on food security um, that we had. And it, it was interesting to me because I know that some of the questions that committee wanted answers to weren't really, they, they weren't answered in the fulsome way that we wanted um, clarity. And one of the questions that came up is, what ultimately is the goal of Nutrition North? Is it to subsidize foods, you know, just on in, in the spirit and intent of just providing a, a subsidy on top? Is it to, um, is the goal to have foods in, on par with costs in Yellowknife? Is it uh, to have foods on par with, a, uh, you know, an average food cost in Canada? And so I, I would just love to have the perspective of the presenters of what really uh, they see as ultimately the goal of Nutrition North. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Levin, Ms. I, I wonder if Catherine or Lisa have an answer to that. I actually wouldn't have anything good to say about their perspective. Like, I don't think they have a vision, a plan, or any intent to actually make a dent in, in uh, food costs in the North. And when you look at the atrocious uh, costs you know, uh, in stores, in northern stores that are supposed to be member driven. Those are supposed to be community driven stores. And you look at the prices and I think, holy crap. Like, how is that possible? And then I, I go back to the, the days I've lived here half a century. So on, the co op boards, the co op boards are, they have local people. Like, I, I don't get it. How local people can be on a co op board and tolerate the prices of that food. So I'm kind of inclined to, you know, lean on the words of Janet and the words of France. Uh, we are not going to solve it through Nutrition North. We're not going to solve it through those co-ops because those are those are drains. They're nothing but drains. So I'd rather divert that money to local food production, to local harvesting programs, and shut that federal what do you call it? Taxpayer drain? You might as well flush that thing. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Cleveland? Uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Kat and Lisa might ha have a smarter, wiser tone than I would. Any other uh, presenters like to answer that question? It's, it's Lisa here. I'll give it a go. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I truly believe that we need to get the power of um, the decision on how we feed our families back to those people that feed those families. Um, in order for a hunter to go out and hunt the couple of times a year that he needs and bring back food on the table, um, that that the hunt the successful hunt being lasting months and months we need the second part of that we need to be get back to canning and we need to get back to having more cold food storage and proper storage for food um, and we need to get back to our Dene culture and our Dene laws of sharing what we have um, and that not being a punishment upon those that share um, because when you're an ECE client relying on them for that program to get your food voucher from them, they ask, did you receive anything? And if Sally says, yeah, I got quarter hind of moose from my uncle. He brought it in. Oh, it was so good. 
sorry, you no longer qualify for food subsidy. You have to live off of that. And it's, it's, it, there, there's just too much uh, way, um, barriers in our system to say that, that that's preventing food from getting to people's mouths. And it, it can't be you deserve more than somebody else. We need to get back to just human kindness and saying, yes, everybody needs money. Businesses don't need money to get the food. It's the people that need the money to be able to purchase and buy that food. And you need things like skidoos to go hunting. You need a fishing rod to fish, you know. And it goes back to the old saying, you know, um, teach a man to fish. You know, he can feed himself for a lifetime, give a man a fish and he only eats for one day. Um, so I don't think this is a matter of trying to reinvent the wheel around how to, but it is about sharing our wealth. And, you know, with the 10-year infrastructure agreement that that is out there, um, it is there's money there to address, literally, food security. So where... Is that going? Is it being going to our smaller communities? And only you guys can answer that. Um, I hope I've answered some of that. Thanks. You did really well. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Laff, do you have anything to add? Yes, I do. Um, so since uh, uh, Nutrition North has um, provided more funding into their subsidy program, uh, food prices have gotten worse. So the reason why is because northern food stores and retailers are actually uh, a monopoly right now and they can't even be considered northern retailers because they're not from the Northwest Territories, they're not actually residents of the North. So somebody needs to look into that to make sure that their profit is not um, pinching off of the subsidies that are supposed to be going to the residents. Thank you. And I think it. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say I think it's up to uh, your group to uh, do that work to find out more about what's happening in with Nutrition North and where those subsidies are going because they're saying that it's going into transportation uh, that most of the cost is to actually transport the food, which is good and all, but then that's that's leaving everybody hungry still. So we need to find another alternative, which is why we're talking about in the North, uh, grow ops and whatnot to make sure that we're manufacturing and distributing our own food and getting rid of the middleman and getting rid of that transportation. That, Mr. Cleveland. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> one of the things I found very interesting in our conversation with Nutrition North was there was a comment that uh, the federal government audits the policy every year, but the policy isn't the basis of the food cost. And when we look at the exorbitant amounts of profit that grocery stores made in the last few years, I think that tells a much different story. And so I, I really appreciate that and I, I really appreciate the, um, the, the words that all of the presenters brought here today because I think there's some really crucial overlap between the messaging um, and also the, the valuable experience that everybody's bringing to the table, so thank you. Thank you for that comment, uh, Ms. Cleveland. Ms. Sashi, do you have anything else to add to any presenters? No, thank you guys so much for, you hit on a lot of good issues that we're looking into already in regards to the food mail or the food subsidy program through the stores. We did have the, all the stores up in front of us already and we are looking into it and we are waiting on feedback from our government in regards to what we're going to do next steps forward and we are trying to hold them accountable for that and then especially uh, Lisa's comments in regards to income support that was really good so that we're going to look into that as a committee in regards to uh, for the food subsidy and what's being taken away and stuff like that and and for uh, earlier the the power the cost of your power for providing service to your your greenhouses and stuff like that we'll look into as well to get them uh, changed if, if it's possible through the minister through us but uh, yeah any questions you do have or anything in writing we'd uh, appreciate it too uh, to send it to us and then uh, we'll have answers to you. Um, just direct them to Katie 
and then we'll go from there. No, thank you guys so much. Next on the list, I have uh, Mr. McMeekin, Riverside uh, Growers. Uh, please proceed, Mr. McMeekin, with your uh, with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this is a a good committee meeting here. It's a lot of stuff to uh, definitely meditate on after this. Um, once again, thanks for taking the time to listen to our business's perspective here on you know some of the food security issues and concerns that we're all been looking at. We've been talking about it for years. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we seem to be making a lot of headway on it, but you know that's why we got into business. One of the primary reasons was to help combat this. Um, I think Janet's really hit on a lot of the big notes here and some of the other speakers here. Um, my presentation was a little bit whipped together here, so, you know, I think maybe it's best that I just speak from our perspective as business owners, producers, residents, you know, of Hay River and the Northwest Territories and give you some insight into the struggles and challenges that we've got. Um, I think plain and simple looking at this, it really comes down to our economics and our environment. You know, affordability is definitely a major portion of this. Although there's, you know, there's really no one silver bullet that's going to solve this and make the problem go away. It's going to take the collaboration of growers, producers, community governments, um, indigenous groups, everybody to, to, to beat this. Um, once again, I mean, our perspective is a little bit more on the economic side of it, but I mean, hey, we're in the business of producing food and our big challenge is, you know, cost of doing business. We're expected to try and keep prices competitive and reasonable so that, you know, A, people will buy our product um, and B, you know, that people are getting quality food at a reasonable price and we're not having to charge too much, so it's accessible. Um, when we look at these high electricity costs, um, high fuel costs, you know, we transport our goods from Hay River to Yellowknife once a week, and costs just keep going up and up. I mean, at some point, we have no choice but to raise prices. Um, somebody has to absorb it. You know, we absorb what we can, but it, it does get passed on to the consumer. And we're left trying to be competitive against markets from Alberta, BC, California, everywhere. And they're producing it at much cheaper rates and able to transport it at cheaper rates. So, you know, it's, it's challenging, for sure. I think, you know... Yeah, there's so many things to touch on here, but at the end of the day, we need our environment around us to be good, just like our plants, you know. We need less constraints. We need to be able to thrive. Um, and we have to be profitable at being in business, you know. We, we rely on this business to put food on our table as well. So... You know, I like I said, I think a lot of the other presenters really nailed a lot of the hot topics here, but, you know, these are kind of the big ones. Uh, you know, energy energy costs are, are definitely prohibitive here. And, I mean, we don't like to think about this, but at the end of the day, you know, financially it would make more sense for us to move three hours south and produce food, and the transports would not be that much difference. So... You know, we don't want to do that, but, you know, at a certain point, if it's more attractive to, do, to grow our food elsewhere, to provide the North, you know, somebody's going to do it that way, and we're always going to be competing against that. So I think we really need to look at how do we reduce those operating costs and support our producers that are already growing and rely on their knowledge Yeah. 
Is uh, you're done your presentation? Yeah, no, it's pretty short and sweet. <laughs> I don't, uh, like I said, I think. Uh, I think no, you hit all the points. You really, really, really hit it. You know, I guess one thing I probably left out was maybe some solutions. You know, um, I mean, I've talked with a couple of the MLAs on this, and ministers, DMs, ugh, for the last five years on some of the challenges that you know are a little more specific to us. You know, hydro rates. You know, we talk about green energy policies, and unfortunately, it seems every time we do the math on trying to go that route, it it just financially doesn't pan out. Um, but you know, we go, well, wait a minute, we're on a hydro community, but at thirty-five cents a kilowatt, you know, that's not going to cut it. Um, previous assembly, I know. They put some of the framework ahead for this assembly. You know, one of them, things out of the business of food was to look at differential power rates. Um, you know, I've had that discussion with the DMs, and uh, I don't know where that is. I mean, it certainly didn't gain anything over the last four years. Uh, bridge tolls, you know. I mean, there's not a lot of us, you know, transporting food that far, but it's a challenge. Um, you know, we certainly plan to expand our capacity down here in the South Slave uh, to service the markets, Yellowknife, you know, being able to bring it up to the, you know, the airport so we can reach some of the communities easier or some of the larger distribution hubs. But, you know, all that stuff adds up, you know, having to pay, oh, I think, what is it, oh, 180 probably for us each time we cross that bridge, you know? Um, so, I mean, it, it's all these little things and that count, you know? The differentiated power rates, you know, Talston now doing their expansion, you know, we could get off a lot of our fossil fuel heating if we could go to electric, but if it financially doesn't make sense, then why would we? You know, we have to make sure that our business is safe and sound financially and in good order in order for us to be able to provide our service and contribute to the territory. Yeah, thank you, Alex, for your presentation. Uh, questions uh, to the members I have, uh, Ms. Knuckleby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. McBeacon, for the presentation. I have to say I'm sad to hear that everything that you've mentioned was exactly the conversation that you and I had three years ago when I went to your greenhouse as the ITI minister. Um, you know, you mentioned to me at the time the energy costs, the fuel costs, um, the, even the bridge tolls, all information I did take back and I'm sort of, I'm very disappointed to hear uh, that nothing did uh, um, make it through to anyone that actually made any changes and unfortunately I no longer had that power after that moment in time to do so. So. Um, I think the biggest uh, thing that I am taking away here um, that you are supporting is the comments earlier about the cost of, it, of doing business being really the biggest issue and, and uh, Ms. Benoit's comments about it's not a food issue, it really is a money issue. Um, I guess I do actually have some questions for you but a bit very specific around uh, the climate change aspect and the flood. Uh, flooding that occurred in Hay River before and, and the impacts to the, the burgeoning agriculture sector uh, at the time. So given that, you know, we've heard a lot here tonight that one thing we can do is to support the existing growers, how did, and, and I may be putting you on the spot and you don't have to speak about it, but how did that go for you? Are you back up and running again at the same capacity? Um, I love the Riverside salads uh, from the Copperas, so I have to admit I was, I was very much missing them when, when you weren't in production. So uh, maybe if you don't mind speaking a little bit more to, to that and how, you know, we could potentially be in the same situation this spring uh, with more flooding in Hay River. So maybe some comments on that, thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, that's good, uh, Alex. Sorry, yes, that's a, a serious concern of ours right now. Um, I mean, welcome to the world of farming. You're never, you're always battling in the environment. Um, you know, fortunately, we are fairly creative, and we do look at finding solutions. Um, a, that specific one, you know, is a serious concern for us as it stands right now. You know, we're at a very pivotal moment in our business. Um, we are looking at tearing everything down um, and relocating to a new location out of um, floodplain, essentially. The water, the floods that we saw this year were extremely devastating to the business. Um, and we have to 
mitigate that risk. Um, we no longer can invest the amount of money we'd like to to grow the business to improve services and contribute. It just doesn't make financial sense in that area. Now, there's other things we can do with that land, which we will. But no, we've we've got to we've got to move forward and adapt to it. That's just the nature of the beast. I mean, you can't. Uh, you just got to keep plugging ahead as hard as it is, and it's it's certainly very difficult. Thank you, um, Ms. Nobby. Yeah, thank you, and and you know I I do want to say like thank you for continuing to persevere and 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 wanting to. Uh, to keep going at it, uh, given how devastating everything was last year, and and you know I think that does actually speak to sort of maybe this fortitude or or this um, difference that really the farming industry and the agriculture sector has, and that it's not, as mentioned earlier, the same type of an industry, and in in many ways uh, it's reminiscent like of the fishers that I also dealt with and such. It's just this, it's almost a, a passion. Um, profession, or not even, uh, that's not even the right word for it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a calling to a lot of people, I think, to be in this type of work, and I very much heard that earlier from other presenters. So, um, you know, yeah, I guess I don't really have much of a question there, just more of a, you know, clearly we want to support you uh, in your rebuild, in your ad adaptation, and I think it, it reconfirms to us as a committee um, the lack of response that's happening across the territory to climate change and and not just to this sector but to all of them so um i just said thanks for hanging in there i appreciate it thanks thank you for your comments uh Ms. Nockaby. mr mcmeekin uh, do you have any other questions from any other members mr o'reilly uh, <laughs> okay uh well thanks mr chair and thanks for the um uh, discussion from uh, Riverside Growers. Um, just a quick comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm pretty sure we buy your basil bunches when they get to Yellowknife because it's they're marvelous, and we just take them and plant them here and put them in our little greenhouse in the front yard. So please do it again <laughs> this uh, this spring. We really look forward to getting uh, your basil bunches. So, but uh, more seriously, um, I hear that you. Are looking at relocating because of the flooding in Hay River and uh, one of the issues that we kind of keep hearing uh, in different ways is about access to good agricultural land and um, I'm just wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that in the in the context of Hay River. Hay River is way different than Yellowknife of course uh, and um, I, maybe you can just talk about how easy it is to access good agricultural land uh, in Hay River, given the, the complexities of climate change and flooding and stuff like that. So uh, I think I'd, I'd find that helpful. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. McMeekin? Yeah, I mean, prior to the flood, you know, hitting the Paradise Valley, which had not flooded in our recorded history, you know, I always... I always looked at it was, you know, the topic comes up a lot. Um, access to land, access to land. Certainly more more of a problem in other regions of the north. Down here, I mean, we had acres and acres of land that was probably underutilized, you know. Um, it certainly could have been utilized a lot more, and it, it still can be. Um, for ourselves, you know, looking at relocating, we've been fortunate enough to locate a sizable portion of land privately um, and I can tell you that's a hell of a lot easier than dealing with municipalities or governments trying to acquire that land but it is few and far between um, there is some other areas down here that are well suited the local municipality here I think is on board with you know getting the development but all that's fine and dandy to talk about but you need people to produce it you need people to work it and if it is not an attractive lifestyle or business, you know, you cannot take care of yourself by doing it, then who's going to do it? You know, um, it, you know, we've seen this over and over, um, unfortunately, in some of the community gardens and that, um, they fire up and then after a while they kind of teeter off, you know. Um, there's a lot of work to farming. Um, there's a lot of work to growing your own foods. It's it takes passion. It takes it 
it takes a lot of fortitude at times and if you're going to do it for a living it, it, it needs to be financially sustainable and that is becoming more and more challenging as time comes on Mr. McMeek and Mr. Wren, any other questions? Any other questions? Hearing none, thank you so much uh, for the uh, presentation, Mr. McMeekin. And, uh, My pleasure. Yeah, and if you have anything else to add, you could just uh, send it to our, um, our committee clerk, uh, Katie, and uh, she'll get it to us, uh, to the committee. And thank you again. So, now we... Um, Thank you all for joining us here today. Presentations will inform will inform our work to make our recommendations to the GNWT what needs to change to improve food security across the Northwest Territories and to our committee to try to work with you to, to do better for the people. We appreciate you guys taking the time to share your ideas, suggestions and feedback with us and uh, this concludes the public portion of our meeting. And thank you everybody for taking the time this evening and presenting to us. And I want to thank my members. Thank you.